I want to start by talking about um, by talking about a little episode that happened um, uh, about a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago. Um, there was a move to put in sewers in uh, in cities around the world, and this move was uh, opposed by many people. Uh, and it was, um, it was a very significant undertaking. We take it for granted now that there are proper, a proper sewage system and we understand the public health importance of that. Um, but at the time, uh, there was less understanding of the uh, importance. There was less uh, of a complete embracement of the importance of that effort. And what was required in many cities was very significant public works expenditures and inconvenience and everything else. So for example, in the city of Chicago, which already by this time was a very large city, the second largest city in the United States, uh, putting in public sewers was a very simple enterprise. All you had to do was to go to each and every building in Chicago and raise it by eight feet, okay? <laughs> no big deal, as you can imagine. So this move for public sewers was in fact um, uh, fought very aggressively uh, by people around, uh, uh, you know, on the scene at the time, including the Economist magazine, who published an editorial um, regarding the, sewer, the publicly financed sewer system in London, saying essentially that um, we don't think this is a good idea because um, filth and misery and disease have their place. They sort out the good folks from the bad folks, and that's what they're supposed to do. And we should not be in the business of interfering with that process. Okay. Um, the reason I raise this issue is because. It was a huge effort to get in public sewers. It was incredibly important. It had an enormous effect on public health. And in fact, it was through the process of proper sewage and proper clean water supplies that um, living standards increased dramatically and life expectancy increased dramatically during this period. Okay? So over the course of the 20th century, we know that we have, you know, life expectancy has gone from, you know, 40 or 50 years, depending on the place, to 70 and 80 years today. That's an enormous improvement in life expectancy. And it's because of public health. And public health has not always been easy. It has not always been opposed. The reason I start with this anecdote is because in a democracy, ethics is a fundamental component of public policy. Uh, one of my colleagues who works on policy and, and health says that policy is like a symphony. Everyone has their part to play. And so the part that I would like to play is to raise ethical issues about the relationship of health and inequality. And that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, so this is um, coming up. That's my son jumping over a win window in the building in Minneapolis. Um, OK. So, covered this. In a democracy, nobody wants to be a jerk. And because nobody wants to be the jerk, everyone wants to justify the policy that they are in favor of on some ethical basis. So I want to make three points today. First, I want to make the point that inequality is a social phenomenon, meaning that we can do something about it. It's under our control. Second of all, that inequality has large effects on human health. And thirdly, that we can therefore improve health. We can choose a society in which the average well-being is better than it is today. We have that in our control. I, I'm not saying that it's easy, but we do have it in our control. OK, so I, just, I think you all having um, you know, an interest in this area, you understand uh, what the issues are. But I want to very quickly review. So this is from work by Piketty and Saez. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It's essentially showing that there was significant inequality in the early part of the 20th century. It went down in the middle of the century, and now it's come back up. Uh, I think you all know that. I want to draw your attention to the role of salaries, which has been relatively consistent over this period, but which have diverged dramatically in more recent years. I'll come back to that. OK. So one of the major influences on inequality has been the, uh, the rise of uh, container shipping uh, and the globalization as a result. So here's a graph of, on the bottom axis, the percentile of the global income distribution and the real growth in incomes over the past two years. And um, so what you can see here is that um, 
In the middle of the income distribution, actually, income growth has been really quite robust. It's been very good. At the top of the income distribution, and again, this is the global income distribution, growth has also been very good. It's really been terrible at, for the very poor, who are globally poor, as well as for what you might consider a kind of upper, upper middle class on a global standard. But this is the middle class of developed countries. So um, this is China's middle class. And I think we all understand how that, uh, with the economics of that. And this is sort of the lower middle class in the United States. Obviously, these two groups are in a kind of labor competition that's fostered by containerization and globalization. Uh, so this is an economic phenomenon. It's not so surprising. Uh, but when we look here, this is an economic issue, but this is a political issue. Okay? So when we talk about uh, inequality and is it uh, something that's primarily political or primarily economic, it really depends on the strata that we're talking about. So I would argue that this is an economic phenomenon. We can buffer that. We can make the consequences less severe for the people who are suffering this. But when you've got this kind of competition, it's just inevitable. But this part is not inevitable. That's political. Okay? We don't need to have these in incredibly high income growth at the top end. Okay, so um, when, we, when we look at the evolution of Gini over time, so this is after taxes and transfers, you can see that the United States and Canada have really pulled apart. Okay? So there, in different countries, there are different trajectories that are possible. Different policy decisions are made. There's a different political environment. There's a different discourse. And all of that affects what happens with inequality. Okay? So yes, there is an economic component that would be shared Canada and the United States would be facing basically the same challenges of technology, of globalization, but there's a different political environment, and so for that reason you see inequality pulling apart in these two different countries. You see something opposite happening in France and Germany. Again, similar countries, uh, but inequality very different in the 1960s, and now not so different. Okay? Different political cultures make different decisions about inequality, and that matters. Those decisions matter. And of course, here's a very dramatic example of Cuba. Uh, I only had data, reliable data, for 1958 before the revolution and 1963 after the revolution. But you can see there's a very large uh, uh, change in inequality in, in that country and obviously extreme policy uh, differences. So um, this is from the New York Times, a recent analysis, looking at um, the Gini coefficient before taxes and transfer, transfers and then after taxes and transfers. And what you can see is that the United States doesn't do so badly when you look at actual income. It does very poorly when you look at uh, post uh, taxes and transfers. That's where the United States fares so poorly compared to uh, you know, most of the rest of the OECD. Um, and then just by comparison, Ireland is the exact opposite. Now, Ireland has, its, uh, has had recent, um, you know, gone through recent you know, problems economically. But nevertheless, this is a striking example that Ireland starts off very unequal but ends up really in the middle of the pack. So again, inequality is a social phenomenon. It's a decision that we collectively make. Yes, it has economic components to it. But there are also strong political components, and we make those decisions. OK, here's uh, another concrete example. And I love this, I love this uh, graph. It's one of my favorites. I use it in my classes all the time. But so this is a um, kernel density estimate of, um, of the wages. Uh, this happens to be women's wages in the United States at two different years. So the dotted line is 1989, in which you can see is something that looks you know, approximately like a, um, uh, a bell curve, roughly. Here is the minimum wage in 1989. It's not doing any good. Okay? It's not having any influence to speak of on the density of this distribution at various locations. Um, by contrast, in 1979, here's the minimum wage. And you can see the solid line. It was a very different distribution. You can imagine that this would have also been a roughly bell-shaped curve. Uh, except that the minimum wage is pushing up on that bell-shaped curve and causing uh, mass or probability density to accumulate here at this point, but then also having these knock-on effects up here. 
okay? Because if you're working in a fast food restaurant, you're paying the uh, guy flipping burgers a minimum wage, the assistant manager has to make something like this and the manager has to make something like that, okay? So it benefits everybody. Okay, again, a policy decision. Yes, there are economic phenomena involved, but we choose to some extent the level of inequality that we have. Okay, finally, a similar example from Britain. Um, and again, this is, um, these are the, uh, the, the you know, after, before and after the introduction of the national minimum wage in uh, uh, Britain. Here we have, you know, obviously it's not exactly a bell-shaped curve, but it ha you know, it's relatively smooth. And then here we see it really is effective at pushing up wages. So these are choices that we make. Um, inequality is a policy variable. So if it's a policy variable, what is the right level? This is the fundamental question that we need to address. What is the right level of inequality? We can't simply stand back and say that uh, you know, whatever it is is fine because we know that whatever it is has arisen out of past choices that we've made. Uh, so the starting point for thinking about what the right level is is John Rawls' theory of justice. And I think this is a particularly compelling work for this purpose. Obviously, Rawls is an ethicist in the philosophical tradition, and he's writing about how we understand the concept of justice. And, um, we can th and, and he recognizes what I think most economists would recognize, that there is productive inequality. In other words, a society that is perfectly equal is not what we're after. Because if a society is perfectly equal, there would be no incentives, and it would be very hard to get anything done. Uh, we need incentives to promote people working hard, to promote them contributing to uh, society, to the economy, uh, to the arts for that matter, um, and we need uh, incentives to foster innovation. So we all benefit when there is some level of inequality because that inequality creates incentives and incentives creates uh, a stronger economy for everybody. Uh, but at the same time, uh, not, all uh, not all inequality is like that. There's also something that we could consider to be destructive inequality. Destructive inequality is inequality that goes too far. Inequality in which uh, the powerful people and the rich people use their power and their wealth to exploit people who have fewer resources. Uh, that becomes destructive. And our economists would understand this as rent seeking, the desire to pull rents out of the economy in ways that are not productive. Okay? So we've got a clear conceptual distinction between productive inequality and destructive inequality. So where do you draw the line? And what Rawls suggests is that um, we will tolerate as much inequality as uh, would make the least well-off better off. Okay, that's a slightly complicated formulation, but I think you get the basic idea, which is that uh, if the inequality is there to make everybody better off, including the least well-off, then that's good, that's productive. But when it goes too far and it makes the least well-off worse off, then we can't tolerate that level of inequality. Okay, and of course he goes further and he says that it's very difficult for us to understand these issues from our current position because we all think that we're contributing fantastically to the economy. We all think that we're worth 150% of what we are actually paid. Uh, and so it's very hard to, um, to assess what is the difference between productive inequality and, and, and uh, destructive inequality. He suggests adopting a, an original position behind a veil of ignorance. And the idea here is that we pretend that we could be at any point in society. And then we strive for that level of inequality. We make choices, policy choices, that would make us better off no matter where we end up in society. Okay, I think this is a very interesting idea. I think it's a powerful idea. And it is the foundation of a lot of ethical thinking around issues of justice. Uh, and it's, I think it's, um, it's, uh, it helps us to think carefully and thoroughly about the policy decisions around inequality that we believe should be made and can be justified in a democratic society. However, we need a measure of well-being. 
If we're going to say that inequality is tolerated if it makes the least well off better off, we need some me measure of well being. And I would propose that health is that measure of well being. All right, health um, correlates well with happiness. Um, health is uh, both um, an end in itself, but also a means to an end. Health is a resource for everyday living, and all of these things contribute to our happiness. Okay? So if you're an economist and you like to think in terms of utility, you can think about happiness as being utility. But basically health is probably a pretty good measure of happiness. Uh, health also correlates well with uh, gross national well-being. So I'm sure you're familiar with attempts uh, around the world to measure not just gross national product, but gross national well-being. And in all of those attempts, happiness and health are fundamental parts of the equation. Health is part of the equation because it is both an instrumental good and an intrinsic good. So we need health to, uh, health is a resource for everyday living. We need health to do uh, pottery or music as well as our jobs. We need health to um, interact with our family members, to make friends, to contribute to a democratic society. So health is a means to an end, but it's also an end in itself, okay? particularly when we think about things like mental health and overall well-being. Finally, and this I think is important, health is relatively easily measured. So we've spent a lot of time in public health and in medicine coming up with robust, careful, objective measures of health, both physical health, mental health. Uh, we talk about um, social functioning. We talk about occupational functioning. We have very good measures of health. The, it, health can be uh, objectively and uh, reliably measured in, across different societies, across different cultures, across different individuals. And so that's a very important thing. When we talk about well-being, we need something that's going to uh, be uh, consistent with an objective measure. And so health, I think, is a very good measure of well-being. So when I talk about inequality in health, I'm not just talking about health. I'm also talking about health as a measure of the society in which we want to live. Okay? Think again of that original position of John Rawls uh, and imagine yourself deciding how would you like to which position, you know, how would you like society organized if you didn't know which position you would end up in? Uh, health is probably one of the things you would think about. And again, I'm not just talking about physical health, I'm talking about mental health, I'm talking about social functioning, and all of that. Okay, so there's been a lot of work on inequality in health, and I'd like to review some of that now. And what we see, this work is all extremely consistent. Um, Richard Wilkinson has done an enormous amount, along with uh, Kate Pickett, um, in this area, but it's quite a large literature within public health. And again, the results are fairly consistent. Uh, so these are, you know, simple, it's a scatter plot of simple correlations. And what you see is that as inequality increases, health problems increase as well. So this is infant mortality rates. And you can see that there's a fairly strong relationship between these two things. And that um, the, I don't know if you can see this, but the correlation coefficient is 0.42, indicating you know, for something that's measured at the ecological level, a fairly strong level of correlation, and the p-value is 0.04. So this is a real relationship here. Um, and of course, you'll notice some of the usual countries down here, the Nordic countries along with Japan have both low levels of income inequality as well as low levels of uh, infant mortality. At the other end of the spectrum, we have my home country, the United States, which has high levels of income inequality and high levels of uh, infant mortality. And then of course, other countries in the middle, Singapore obviously being a very interesting outlier. Um, we can do the same analysis with uh, obesity. Uh, and so here we see again a high correlation, 0.57. The p-value is less than 0.01. Uh, similarly, the United States is very high, again on inequality, but also on obesity. And Japan does very well. Here are the, the Nordic countries, again, uh, faring quite well on both measures, other countries in between. Okay. Um, so we can look at drug use. Uh, drug use 
uh, again, the United States, very high. This time, at least, not a complete outlier in terms of the health problem, but among the highest. Um, and again, we have Japan, the Nordic countries here, other countries in between. Okay, uh, homicide rates. Uh, here we have the United States, again, being extremely high on this particular uh, outcome. Again, high correlation, uh, low p-value. Uh, Japan, the Nordic countries, um, other countries in between. The scale on this one is a little bit different because the United States is so far out of whack. Um, there are reasons for that, but, um, but nevertheless, the general pattern still obtains. Uh, teen births. So here we have, um, again, Japan, the Nordic countries, the other end of the spectrum, the United States. Um, Teen births is a tremendously important uh, public health outcome. Uh, women are, women's bodies are not fully capable of uh, giving, having healthy births uh, before age roughly 22. Um, the adolescent mind is not fully developed until roughly age 25. Um, from a social, th those are from, th those are the biological perspectives. From a social perspective, uh, teenagers are just not equipped to be parents. Uh, for the most part, for social reasons. They need to finish their education. They need to solidify their identity as constructive adults. Uh, and so they have less time available or less mental capacity for dedicating to a child. So teen births is one of the main signal outcomes that we look at when we talk about public health. Um, and finally, uh, one more uh, mental illness. Um, Again, we have the same pattern with the United States at the top. So this is the percent with any mental illness. Um, and, then, uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we have Japan. Um, this, we don't have such good data uh, on this outcome as for the other outcomes. Okay, it's a little bit harder to reliably identify mental illness. You don't want it to be just about diagnosis because then the health system you know, differences uh, may um, may lead to different uh, 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 um, uh, identification. So, uh, so th but this is, these are the countries for which reasonably high quality data are available, and you can see the same pattern. Okay. So um, you can see that I've gone through many different measures of health, and they're all very different. These are, so I talked about obesity, I talked about homicide, I talked about drug use, I talked about infant mortality, talking about mental health. Uh, these are all very different things. So the bio, uh, biopsychological etiology of these diseases is all very different. Right? If you talk to uh, medical researchers, for example, those who are interested in mental health would have very little to say about homicide even, uh, very little to say about drug abuse, and almost nothing to say about obesity. Okay? The researchers who are active in obesity would have, again, from the medical side, would have very little to say about mental health, and nothing to say about homicide, okay? And yet, we see that there is this strong pattern across all of these, which is not only a strong pattern, but essentially the same pattern across these etiologically very distinct disease types. So there must be something social going on here. So here's the summary, um, just to give you a general sense, and this is the same data. Um, but uh, collapsed into a single index of health problems, okay? So, but it's basically the same data that I've showed you before. And, of course, we get the same results, the U.S. being an outlier, uh, Japan here, along with the Nordic countries. And one of the points that um, was made in this particular report, uh, this, by the way, the citation is over here if anyone is interested, and I think all these slides will be posted so you can get the underlying data for anything that you're interested in. But one of, the, uh, one of the points that's made is that Japan and Sweden are, in fact, very, very different countries. Okay, they both like fish, but <laughs> other than that, uh, they're very different. Um, and, uh, and yet, their outcomes on both of these measures are really quite similar. By contrast, Spain and Portugal, Luisa, close your ears, are very similar. <laughs> Uh, many people would consider them to be very similar, unless you're from Portugal. Um, and, but what we see, though, is that their outcomes are, in fact, quite different. Their outcomes are very different. 
So when we think about the structure of the basic economy, when we think about you know, cultural values and norms, uh, we have to recognize that those are probably not the major things that are driving this phenomenon. That in fact it is, inf that it is inequality itself that is generating this pattern. And I think that's a very interesting finding. I think that, uh, that the fact that we have such disparate countries having similar results and such similar countries having such different results uh, suggests that uh, you know, there really are uh, policy decisions that are made and that could be reversed, but they're having major effects. Okay. So, and by the way, a similar argument could be made, here's the United States and here's Canada. Also, in many ways, very similar countries culturally, in terms of the structure of the economy and all of that, uh, and yet very, very different outcomes here. All right. So there are no numbers on this graph, but let me give you a sense of the range of health outcomes from sort of the cluster down here at the bottom, not the very best, but the cluster here at the bottom versus the cluster here at the top. Um, and if we look at that range of inequality, that's associated with a doubling of health risks. Okay? This is not a small effect. This is a major effect. And in fact, it corresponds to about a year and a half of lost life expectancy. In other words, if we go from you know, roughly the 20th percentile to the 80th percentile in terms of income inequality, we lose about a year and a half of life expectancy. Now that's a population average. So when I began talking about the importance of health, I said that uh, or, or about the policy around uh, inequality, I made the point that inequality could be tolerated if it made the least well-off better off. Okay? And I argued that health is a good metric for measuring uh, the sense of being well-off. Um, so we, I'm not showing you here the least well-off. I'm showing you population averages uh, because in my field, <coughs> population health is actually different than individual health. Population health can emerge from different kinds of processes than individual health does. So, um, so that's why I'm showing you the averages. If we were to look at, let's say, the 20th percentile of a population and look at their health outcomes, the effects would be even worse. Okay? I don't have those data. It's harder to get those data. It's less precise. We do have very good population level averages. So that's what I've shown you here. But I would argue that if uh, we can't, if inequality is so severe that the population average suffers, then surely it's too, uh, too severe to meet the uh, requirements of John Rawls' theory of justice. That you wouldn't want to live, you wouldn't want to take your chances living in a society that's so unequal that your average life expectancy would be a year and a half less just because you live in that kind of a society if you don't know where you're going to end up. Okay, so that is the first point that I would like to make, that inequality is very severe and it's severe enough to justify some kind of policy action on ethical bases. Okay, so now what is it about inequality that causes poor health and how does it do it? So I'm going to start with um, a, uh, a graph and I will walk you through this graph. I, I, it's not, I'm, I don't want to be overly technical but um, I think this is fairly straightforward. So here you have uh, income on one axis and, and health on the other axis. And I think it's fairly intuitive that um, if you have zero income at all, if you truly had zero income, including you know, no government transfers or supports or anything like that, your health would be really very poor. Um, and a, a relatively small additional income would make you much better off. Okay, if you're absolutely homeless and you're eating out of garbage cans, then just being housed would help a lot. Just a small monthly stipend to buy proper food would help a lot. And your health would increase dramatically. At the other end of the spectrum, if you're already very wealthy, then adding that same unit of income to your, to your income would have very small influence on your health. Okay? So to the person who has nothing, $10,000 is a fortune. To the person who makes $500,000 a year, an extra $10,000 is virtually nothing. 
and has very small impact on the health. So we have this concave shape. If we were to have a society in which everyone had the average level of income, mu, that would be the health level. If we took, if we randomly took from 50% of the population an increment and, uh, and made them poorer so that they are down here at YB and redistributed that increment to uh, the other randomly chosen half of the population, put them up at YA, we would have half, half the population at YA, the other half at YB. This would be the health of the low income half. This would be the health of the high income ha uh, half. And the average health would be here at H0. So what you can see is that average health is going to be lower in countries with greater dispersion of income. And that's sort of expressed here. Health, individual health is a function of individual income. All right, and the function is upward sloping and the second derivative is uh, negative. And so the population health level, so P is the population health level. The population health level is, um, is a function of the average population and also the distribution of the population. Sorry, this should have been the distribution of the population. That was a typo. Okay. Um, so uh, in inequality directly reduces average health. Uh, okay. Now, the question is, um, and so inequality directly reduces individual health. So inequality directly reduces both individual health and population health for that reason. Now here's the question that's occupied much of the pu public health literature, which is, does inequality reduce this, this function for everyone? So independent of the effects through individual income, does inequality have an effect on uh, population health and individual health because it shifts downward the health production function. That's the question that a lot of the literature has been engaged in identifying. So all those graphs that I showed you were simply about average health and average income inequality. Now at the individual level we want to know is it just that we're still on this one graph or is there a shift downward in this graph? That's what the literature is trying to identify. Now that's an important and it's an interesting question, but we should not let that question distract us from the fact that even if there is no downward shift of this function, inequality still reduces population health. Okay? So regardless of whether this curve shifts downward or not with inequality, that's a very scientifically interesting question. It's not a policy interesting question, okay? because we already know that inequality reduces average health. Okay, so this is a barrel. This is Niagara Falls. This is the analogy. You can go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. It's perfectly safe. There are no health dangers at all for doing so, as long as you don't land. Uh, so when we talk about the effects of inequality on health, and we attempt to control for individual level income, we're saying you can go over Niagara Falls in a barrel if you control for the effects of landing. To me, that makes no sense. When we talk about income inequality, we are talking about individual, health, individual income. We're talking about everybody's individual income. So to look at the effects of income inequality on health, controlling for individual income, makes no sense. Okay? It's like saying, what are the effects of going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, controlling for the effect of falling. Okay? It doesn't make any sense. It's a scientifically interesting question, but from a policy perspective, we already know enough about going over the falls in a barrel to be able to say, don't do it. It's not safe. Okay, so income inequality is really a symptom. It's a symptom of a set of rules that works for the few and not for the many. We have very good data on income. That also is comparable and objective across different individuals across different uh, jurisdictions within a country, across different countries. Okay? We have great data. There is a tendency to want to follow the data on, income inequ on inequality by, by identifying income inequality. Now income inequality is a very interesting phenomenon, but it is just a symptom of this broader issue of imbalance of control. So what I want to do now in just a few minutes is talk about some of the specific examples of imbalances in power 
that lead to differences in how well people control resources. That affects health. Okay? So I'm going to try to articulate some of the causal mechanisms through which inequality, not income inequality, but inequality affects health. So I'll start with control over resources. Um, so this is uh, an example that's taken from um, Paul Farmer's work in Haiti. And uh, Paul Farmer starts with this fact that he, uh, this young woman, Asefi, dies of dehydration brought on by diarrhea. Okay, so that's what she died of. But what caused the dehydration? It was HIV AIDS. Okay, so from a strict physiological perspective, she died of dehydration. But that's not enough. We have to say that she actually died of AIDS, right? How did she get the AIDS? What caused the AIDS? The AIDS was caused by unprotected sex. Now, for a lot of people in the United States, it ends there because it ends with personal responsibility. And you can say, well, she shouldn't have had unprotected sex. But Paul Farmer digs into this more deeply and he says that she has unprotected sex because she had an unprotected livelihood, meaning that she had no way to make money. She had no way to make money because her family had land in uh, Haiti that was completely unproductive and was unable to support the family. Why did she have land that was on a slope? There was a great deal of erosion of the topsoil. The land was unproductive. Why did she have that land? Well, she had that land because um, the U.S. Uh, Agency for In International Development, along with the Haitian government, created a dam that flooded the lowlands in the area where Asifi lived. And in flooding the lowlands, the, as you can imagine, that, those were the most productive farmland. That was what everyone lived on. When you flood that area to create a dam, you then move people up the slopes. Now they're on the slopes of the river valley. And in Haiti, it's quite mountainous. So the slopes are quite steep. There's a great deal of erosion. The land is not productive. It can't support the same number of people that it used to support. Um, so it was the dam that ultimately caused Asifi's diarrhea and death. So the first uh, connection is a medical connection. The second connection is a public health connection. So we know, so this saying that dehydration was brought on by HIV, that's a medical issue. To say that the HIV was brought on by unprotected sex, that's a public health issue. That's what we talk about all the time. We talk about how to protect yourself. We talk about disease prevention and health promotion. Okay? So this is what we talk about all the time. The connection between the unprotected livelihood and the unprotected sex is an economic connection. So just parenthetically, my work is interested in these three boxes. So that's an economic connect connection. Why is it that people have an unprotected, if they have no resources, why do they have unprotected sex? In Asafi's case, because she couldn't support herself, she could not live off of farming, she uh, went and slept with the military people who had a salary from the government. Sleeping with the military people meant that they paid her money, and, and that's how she was able to keep herself alive, and as well as her little sister. So that money went for food. She was forced into that relationship not because she was reckless, not because she was unthinking, but because she needed the money. And this was a way of getting the money. Okay. Then the connection between the dam and the unprotected livelihood is a structural connection. Okay. That's at the macro level what we're looking at. Okay. So uh, concretely in the United States, and I'm going to speed up a little bit here, um, but we can look at uh, this, this is income inequality between male MDs and female MDs. There's a $29,000 annual pay gap. So you would think of that as inequality, gender-based inequality. What does it do to? Half of that is due to the fact that uh, women are less likely to go into medical specialties. Medical specialties pay an enormous amount in the United States. Um, primary care does not. And so that counts for most of that um, difference. Um, this is a committee that in the United States controls medical compensation. It's called the RUC. I'd be happy to talk in more detail about this. But the key point here is that the gray are the technical staff. The blue represent primary care physicians, pediatricians, gerontologists, family doctors, and the red represent the specialists. When you have a committee of this size composed 80% of specialists, they are going to vote to uh, set 
specialty physician compensation extremely high. The primary care physicians in the United States don't earn very much. It's the specialists who earn enormous amounts of money. Okay, so some analysis that was done. Um, this is the price of generic drugs in the United States relative to the OECD average is one to one. The price of patent drugs in the US relative to the OECD average is two to one. Okay, so we in the United States are paying twice as much for our drugs that are on patent as the rest of the OECD. That's because of decisions that were made uh, to not have negotiation of dr over drug prices in the United States. Okay, same, I just showed you the sources of compensation for primary care. U.S. doctors are paid about what they are paid in the OECD, but specialists are paid twice as much, even, even when you adjust for GDP per capita. Overall, in the United States, we waste $750 billion a year, that's billion with a B, on unnecessary medical services, uh, excessive administrative costs, prices that are too high. I showed you a couple of the prices. Um, the result is that in the United States, medical spending crowds out other expenditures, such as higher education, economic development, critical infrastructure. I see you have a train over here that, that was financed by the European Investment Bank. We're desperately trying to build our first high-speed rail in California. Uh, it's not going so well, but we might actually get it done. But this is the kind of stuff that gets shoved to the side because of our high medical expenditures. Okay, and here is our medical expenditures per capita as a percent of GDP and um, life expectancy. And just to further make that point, um, overall government expenditures, the United States is middle of the pack for the OECD, neither especially high nor especially low, but because so much of it is spent on medical spending, less gets spent on this other stuff. This is the issue of uh, inequality. When you have institutions like the R RUC that I mentioned, like the fact that we don't negotiate over drug prices, it drives up medical spending in ways that are wasteful. They don't do any good for health. They also promote high levels of income inequality. And then there's not enough money left over for things that really would improve health, such as education, such as infrastructure, uh, such as there's an effort now for what's called complete streets to make our, street, our cities more bikeable. And that's what falls through the cracks. Okay, so um, excessive inequality and control over resources uh, impairs health. So I think I'm going to stop there and give some time for questions. And um, I just want to sum up by saying that, again, inequality is something that is under our control. We have to think not in terms just of income inequality, but in terms of the power structures that drive resource allocations in society that either work to promote health or fail to promote health. And I would argue that we've gone too far, uh, in, uh, especially in the United States, uh, but po possibly also in certain other countries in the OECD. And that by ratcheting back the level of inequality in these concrete ways, we can actually improve health for everyone. And I think that that's what we should do at this point. <laughs>